So throughout the entire 24 year history of the Pokemon trading card game, out of the over 9,000 cards released, only 35 cards have ever been banned from competitive play. And of those, only 25 are still banned. That's surprisingly low. Like, Yu-Gi-Oh!, which launched after Pokemon, currently has 101 cards in its forbidden list. Magic the Gathering, in its 27 years, currently has 53 cards in its modern format and 102 cards banned in its more expansive legacy format tournament list. With any trading card game, there's bound to be some cards that are more powerful than intended, but it's clear there's a bit more restriction as to what effects Pokemon cards are given. So how powerful does a Pokemon card have to be in order to get banned? How much game-breaking power does a Pokemon card need to possess in order to be removed from competitive play before it's even released? Well, in September 2000, right in the middle of a worldwide Pokemon craze, fueled by Nintendo's monolithic marketing push, Wizards of the Coast was about to show us. This is a story about a Pokemon card that was banned before it was even released. You might remember Pokemania. Pokemon is now in full mania. Global marketing phenomenon. Pokemon the movie joins Pokemon the video game. Pokemon and Jigglypuff Daddy. And this is going to be one of the hottest selling toys for the holidays. This is a talk. For a single moment in the late 90s, after a fast flash of months of marketing and a concept really well geared towards playground conversations, suddenly everyone in the world was focused on just one thing. These silly little creatures called Pokemon. Pokemon was everywhere, and news stations loved to point that out, which only bolstered its popularity. It seemed, though, that throughout the entire conversation was one thought. Pokemon was a fad. But North American audiences didn't see the Japanese side of the craze. See, in 1998, Game Freak and Nintendo had a hit on their hands. Two years ago, after the release of Game Freak's nearly studio-ending role-playing game, Pocket Monsters Red and Pocket Monsters Green, a steady boil of popularity produced a juggernaut of a household name. At least, in Japan. Up to this point, most Japanese media didn't get localized to the US, so something had to be really big in order to make it through that step. And fortunately for Game Freak, Pokemon was really, really big. Nintendo, at this point, were the masters of introducing things to the Western market. They essentially revived the US video game market with the NES, and just recently sold the Game Boy simply on the nature of it having Tetris. But Pokemon was different. Pokemon was cute and had grayscale graphics, and North American audiences were busy gawking at Goldeneye and Tomb Raider and Street Fighter. And Pokemon was long, too. It was an RPG, which was a genre that never really quite landed culturally in the US, at least on the scale it did in Japan. But Pokemon was so big in Japan, it would be stupid not to at least try. So for a while, they did. They started talking about how they could alter it to better resonate with Western markets. They, they thought, maybe if it was like baseball, the kids in the US would like it. Why is, why is he like that? <laughs> what was that voice? <laughs> Maybe if it was like baseball, the kids in the US would like it. Maybe if the Pokemon were less cute, more graffiti-like. But it was too big. Splintering Pokemon wasn't gonna work. It, it wasn't just a game at this point. It was a massive franchise. They stumbled into the phenomenon organically in Japan, and now they had to manufacture it. In the fall of 1998, Pokemon began the rollout of a massive marketing campaign. So they planned to release the anime first, figuring that kids who liked the long nature of stories and cartoons would then be eased into the depth of the games. So then three weeks later, the games would come out and they'd focus mainly on the collectability of Pokemon. Presumably figuring that baseball cards did pretty well in the US. But a cartoon series and a video game does not a phenomenon make. They, they needed more, they needed a lot more. 
So they teamed up with Nintendo of America's PR company, and armed with a marketing budget four times as large as previous games, Pokemon was about to be thrust into the daily lives of every American living in the turn of the century. Pokemon figures and Pokemon lollipops, Pokemon on school book covers and KFC buckets and Lunchables, they, <laughs> they even convinced the city of Topeka, Kansas to rename their town Topikachu, where they just dropped Pikachu plushies from the sky. And within the wild scramble of marketing and cross-promotion, Nintendo worked with creators of Magic the Gathering to bring the Pokemon trading card game to the US. And it latched on, fast. Playgrounds turned into mini Wall Streets for training, and new shipments of Pokemon cards were treated like museum artifacts. And these were not just some digital simulacrum of a Pokemon like it was in the games. These were an honest-to-God physical collectible Pokemon, resonating directly with that gotta catch em all mentality. And you could play it at school, where you couldn't bring your Game Boy, or for kids who couldn't convince their parents to buy a Game Boy and buy a copy of Pokemon, a booster pack of cards was way cheaper. Or, in some cases, they'd just give them to you. Nintendo knows the power of cross-promotion. So Nintendo began producing a bunch of different promotional cards to be distributed alongside various different events and merchandise. And these were fully playable and tradable cards, sometimes even being somewhat competitively viable. So alongside every movie release, every DVD release of those movies, and at Pokemon Leagues from 1999 to 2002, Wizards of the Coast would include these Black Star promo cards. All told, Wizards of the Coast produced 53 different promotional cards in various marketing efforts with Nintendo. Of those 53 cards though, one stands out. One of those 53 cards was banned before it even released. The knowledgeable among you might have seen the title of this video and remembered Ancient Mew, uh, which was a card that was created for distribution alongside ticket purchases to the power of one. Ancient Mew is printed in some sort of like runic language, so it stands out pretty quickly among the sea of rare cards. You might have even thought this video might be about Ancient Mew, since it's written about so often on the internet. But Ancient Mew was banned alongside its release, not before it was released, and has since had a reprint which makes it entirely tournament legal in Japan. The card that I'm talking about the card that was banned before it was released. The only Black Star promo card to ever get banned. That card is this card. It's pretty unassuming. Featuring art of a Pikachu sitting in front of a birthday cake and a present with some hollow foil effects surrounding it. It's only move does just 30 damage, and it's got a pretty strange name, or as it's known colloquially, Birthday Pikachu. But why ban this card? You might be like me. When I was a kid, I didn't really read the rules, so I just assumed it was like the games. Like, like you put out a Pokemon, you take turns using moves until you defeated all six Pokemon, and the comments on the official tutorial video makes me think that might not just be me. So I want to take a minute to get everyone on the same page regarding the most basic, relevant rules of the game. The Pokemon Trading Card Game is a turn-based competitive strategy game for two players. Two players place Pokemon out onto the field and play energy cards to power moves and trainer cards to add support effects. Each player has up to six Pokemon in play, five which sit on the bench, and one which is the active Pokemon. The active Pokemon is able to use moves, given that it has the right number and type of energy. Each player has a deck of 60 cards. Players take turns playing cards and using moves to damage the other Pokemon on the field. Pokemon have health, indicated on the top right corner, and when they gain enough damage to equal or surpass that number, they are knocked out. 
Pokemon from the bench then replaces that Pokemon, and the trainer who knocked out the Pokemon is then able to take one of six of their prize cards. There are three conditions to win. You can win by picking up all of your prize cards, you can win if your opponent is out of playable Pokemon, or if your opponent is out of drawable cards. And that's all there is to the game itself. There's a bit more to it than that, uh, but that should give you everything you need to know for the sake of keeping up with this video. But there is a little bit more context surrounding the game itself. Bear with me, th this will be quick. So in order to keep things interesting, trading card games have to keep releasing newer, fancier cards with new and interesting uses. Pokemon releases cards in sets, each containing Pokemon cards, trainer cards, and energies. There was the base set in 1996 in Japan, and since then they've released over 80 different sets, each with their own unique themes, mechanics, and more complex trainer card effects, and with each new release saw more and more cards adding to the growing list of cards that could theoretically be played. For a while, Media Factory, the company behind publishing the trading card game in Japan, felt it was okay for the game to let them pile up. But in the US, with Wizards of the Coast at the helm, they had a bit of a pedigree to maintain. At this point, they had years of history running tournaments and maintaining balance between hundreds of cards, so naturally they had a pretty specific idea of how to extend that to the Pokemon trading card game. But Media Factory refused to let Wizards of the Coast make any changes to card text or to pass out any bans to any cards. To them, Pokemon was a game chiefly for kids, and administering and explaining bans would have been difficult. But by 2001, it started to get too much. The metagame became completely dominated by decks containing functionally only trainer cards and very few Pokemon. Wizards of the Coast's strategies to maintain a viable tournament scene were restricted by Media Factory's wishes for the game, so they came up with a loophole. They needed to remove certain trainer cards from the game without the ability to ban them directly, so they took the nuclear approach of removing entire sets. Adopting from one of their Magic the Gathering tournament variations, they introduced the modified format. The idea being that they'd only allow the most recent few sets in play, with plans to continuously rotate them out. The effect here was twofold. Not only did it give them control over the metagame, it also made deck building a lot easier, as players only had to plan to encounter the most recent few sets of cards. It meant that phases of mechanics could come and go. In fact, this format worked so well that it would actually end up becoming the standard format today. But that didn't quite fix everything. There was still one card that worried them. There was still one card that, if left unchecked, would have wreaked havoc on the competitive scene. That card? Sneasel. Oh, yeah, sorry, it's, it's Sneasel. Yeah, it's Sneasel, not... Yeah, I, I, I realized that it, it sounded like I was lead... Yeah, it's Sneasel. Neogenesis Sneasel, which was from a set allowed in the first rotation, was remarkably powerful. Appearing in roughly every tournament deck at the time, it was getting to be a problem. It comes down to Beat Up, which is a two dark energy move that has you flip a coin for each of your Pokemon in play and count the number of heads. Then, multiply that by 20. That's how much damage it does. That, combined with the fact that Sneasel was an unevolved Pokemon, meant that as soon as turn two, Sneasel could put out an average of 80 damage per turn, 140 at max output. For reference, the next strongest two energy move at the time was Electabuzz's Thunder Punch, dealing only 35 damage on average. The highest HP on a Pokemon at this point was 120, which wouldn't be surpassed until 2003, when EX Pokemon were introduced, which were intended to be extra powerful versions of already existing Pokemon, rewarding a knockout with two prize cards instead of one. Ironically, Sneasel was reintroduced as one of those extremely powerful cards, and even then, they still nerfed Beat Up. So in these very specific circumstances, Media Factory finally allowed Wizards of the Coast to ban one card. Since then, there have been 34 other cards which have received such a ruling, and now you might see why that number is so low. In the early days, they were incredibly slow to ban cards, not for a lack of trying. Now, mainly, it's to prevent certain combos from happening. The specific case where a new card and an old card combine in an unexpected way. There was a sweep of nine cards all banned at once because they caused too much disruption to an opponent's hand, something the modern game design team decided didn't make for fun or creative gameplay. 
Blaine's quiz show was banned because it required the opponent to correctly guess a Pokemon based on one of its moves, which would be practically impossible to play between languages. Tropical Beach was given out to certain finalists in Worlds 2011 and 2012, meaning it's pretty relatively rare. And since it's competitively viable, the fact that it's rare meant essentially locking playstyles behind a really high cost barrier. And that's all well and good, but, but here's the thing, Birthday Pikachu was the first numbered card ever banned. Actually, Birthday Pikachu was banned before they even started banning cards. Yeah, when Sneasel was banned during the announcement of the modified format, they actually also announced that both Ancient Mew and Birthday Pikachu would be unplayable, which were both already ruled unplayable. Wizards of the Coast seemingly had a little bit more leeway when it came to announcing promotional cards as unplayable cards. Sneasel, of course, had an incredibly game-breaking move, but what did Birthday Pikachu have? Birthday Pikachu doesn't have any abilities or Pokemon powers. It features just a single move, Birthday Surprise. Its move description is the following. If it's not your birthday, this attack does 30 damage. If it is your birthday, flip a coin. If heads, this attack does 30 damage plus 50 more damage. If tails, this attack does 30 damage. The logic here is probably obvious. Anybody could just declare today their birthday and claim the 50 extra damage. At best, that would mean checking an ID every time a player wanted to use this, something Wizards of the Coast deemed unwieldy. So then, hold on, why was Ancient Mew banned? Wizards of the Coast never gave an official reason as to why Ancient Mew was banned. On July 13th, 2000, in one of their weekly Q&A chats, they said that, yes, actually, the card would be playable. And then by August 25th, the card was banned. There seemed to be a lot of discussion over its status, but it isn't a good card at all, so it's strange that it posed such a point of contention for the English community. I want to emphasize this a bit here. Ancient Mew was not by any measure a good card. It wasn't competitively viable, and it had an official means for translating and playing the card bundled alongside its distribution. Seriously though, look at this. Look how many people were asking questions about it. This relatively weak, fun promotional card practically threw a wrench into the competitive scene. There's one chat where they mentioned banning the card because it was only meant for fun. Obviously, that proved to be too much for the American audiences, so Wizards of the Coast, possibly out of frustration, banned it. So it's no surprise that Birthday Pikachu, in the almost immediate wake of Ancient Mew, was banned essentially alongside its announcement. And so that was it. For functionally the last time, Pokemon experimented with a non-tournament legal promotional card. They would later go on to release comically overpowered cards, but those were released as non-regulation sized cards, and in the more modern 2013 era, they'd release some of these more fun cards, but functionally, for the foreseeable future at this point, they'd stop making any cards meant only as a fun thing. Or, for functionally the last time in America. Japan is pretty well known for its vending machines. It's pretty much the first thing tourists make observations about, and it's a pretty big part of the culture there. Not that vending machines are always trying to sell you something, more that there's a feeling that there'll always be a vending machine if you need one. And in case you didn't think that far ahead, it's not just for drinks and snacks, but for toys and meals and clothes, and yes, Pokemon cards. In 1998, before and during the American rollout of Pokemon, Media Factory created a set of cards that were available on sheets through vending machines. They made three of these expansion sets. The first two had three cards on each of the 18 sheets each, with cardboard damage indicators and coins in the top right corner. The third set, however, was a bit different. Imagine being in Japan around now, where Pokemania isn't nearly as tacky as it would be in early 2000s America. What I mean is that they didn't really have anything to prove over there. They weren't trying yet to make a massive media franchise out of nothing. In that way, you can imagine Game Freak feeling that there's a bit more room for fun with the Pokemon brand in Japan. And so have fun they did. The third vending machine card set did away with the damage indicators in the extra space and instead had some special cards there. Some of those were deck suggestion cards, which is the first and only time anything like these have ever been produced. Each of the six themed around a different location from the Game Boy games. 
More interestingly though, there's the extra rules cards. You'll notice the specific different card classification in the top bar. These five cards are the only ones to have that. These extra rules cards contain adjustments to the base rules of the game, like this one which simulates confusion damage the way that it works in the video games, or this one which reduces the number of prize cards to four, functionally shortening the game, or this one which suggests a best of three simultaneous match, which you didn't really need a rule card to tell you that you could do. There's Bill's PC, which asks you to send in one of five Pokemon cards alongside itself to receive the evolved form of those cards, once again simulating a mechanic in the video games. Bill's PC is categorized as a pass card, which if this video is the longest of your exposure to the trading card game, you might not catch how strange that is. There are only five card classifications. There are, of course, sub-classifications, like items which fall underneath the broad classification of trainer cards, but the broad categories I mentioned before, Pokemon cards, trainer cards, and energy cards, contain every other card in the game. Pass cards and extra rules cards are entirely separate classifications, and exist only to contain these cards. A couple cards do exist that change some gameplay for specific tournament rule variations, but these were classified as trainer cards and included inside decks. Oh, and then there were these cards. What you're seeing right now are officially released, regulation-sized, real Pokemon cards. Each of them are hand-drawn, and some of them aren't even categorically cards, but they're officially part of the Vending Machine expansion set, so they're cards in that sense. Here's the most normal of them, at the very least being actually categorizable as a Pokemon card. The two moves here are Greetings, which lists the damage as about 10, and Fake Sleep, which suggests that you pretend to be asleep only to then surprise your opponent by waking up. This one's a joke card depicting some art of a machine in the Pokemon card factory. The next one here is a hand-drawn trainer card, Imakuni's Nasty Plot, which features uh, this. Now, the whole story of Imakuni will have to wait for a future video. <clears throat> but in short, he's a musician who's worked on a lot of the music for the Pokemon anime and was a big player in promoting the trading card game. He is eccentric and he is incredible. He's got this costume that he's always seen in, which I can only describe as a news channel's best attempt at a Pokemon. But back to his nasty plot card. The text on this card reads, when you play this card, you may remove damage counters when your opponent isn't looking. And no matter what they ask, pretend you don't know about it. And the cards just get more and more wild from here. Imakuni's PC is a parody of Bill's PC, which I'll remind you was also introduced in this expansion, meaning that one, you might see this card first, and two, Imakuni's PC is the only other card classified as a pass card. Imakuni's Corner is just a card which contains a note from Imakuni saying, Hi everyone, Pokemon cards are cool, and defending his trainer card from a previous promotion, which simply confuses your own Pokemon, and lose, which is just Imakuni in a hole, insisting that maybe losing isn't so bad after all. These vending machine cards were only released in Japan. People were surprisingly eager to get their hands on them, but really they just wanted the Pokemon contained on the rest of the expansion sheets. And they did end up getting some of them, released in various promotional events and whatnot, but none of these Expansion 3 cards got released at all. Pretty soon after this, Wizards of the Coast lost their distribution rights to the Pokemon Company, and since then, the international look of Pokemon was set, and the silliness present in Japan stayed in Japan. Birthday Pikachu then stands tall in the history of Pokemon being one of the only cards released for fun in America, while also sitting at the cross-section of a huge number of card oddity Venn diagram circles. I didn't even mention the fact that it's one of only two cards banned from the Unlimited format. Imagine what it would have been like if Pokemon was more unapologetically Japanese. American games journalism narratives at this point was a lot of, look at this game, it's weird because it's from Japan, and seeing that, the Pokemon company and by extension Nintendo decided that perhaps there was no room for silly outside of Japan. 
The general cultural acceptance of absurdity isn't really a topic in scope for this video, but it's pretty safe to say that for Nintendo's initial marketing goal of global domination, keeping absurd out of the international Pokemon scene was kind of required. But this doesn't stay with just Pokemon. Once Nintendo really started proving that North American audiences reacted better generally to things which beg you to take them seriously, they started polishing silly out of their entire international release scene. It's gotten better in recent years, but even during the last Nintendo Direct, while we were getting DC superhero girls, Japanese audiences were getting a light summer vacation game. Or like, Mother 3? Boy, I hope that line ages poorly. Nintendo has time and time again proven that they think there's no room for nonsense outside of Japan. Outside of some core fans, of course, but cult classics don't really satisfy investors. No, Nintendo is looking to make something the casual observer might look at from the outside and say, I wonder what this is about. They're looking for something with more general appeal. They're looking for a Pokemania. Hey, thanks so much for watching the video. If you want to join the list of faces scrolling by on your screen, you can subscribe to me on Twitch or join me on the Patreon where you'll also be able to find a whole bunch of bonus features, including for this video. How do you, how are you supposed to add the video? Do you just?